Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, good night, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning into the International Actuarial Association's broadcast today. Today, we are going to have a brief chat or conversation with Mrs. Daisy Koch. And this chat is um, very much in accordance with the IAA's new mandate with respect to diversity and inclusion. This month, the month of March, we are celebrating International Women's Day. And Daisy is our featured interviewee. Mrs. Daisy Koch, to many of us, needs no introduction. But I'm pleased to give you a very brief one. She has been described as a trailblazer or as a pioneer. Uh, to many of us who are, in the, who are from the Caribbean, Daisy is simply the mother of the actual profession. Daisy has been honored by many bodies. She's been honored by the government of Jamaica with an order of distinction, commander class. She also holds the order of Jamaica. Many international actuarial bodies have also honored her. The IACA provided her with the Max Lander Award. She's also an honoree of the International Association of Black Actuaries and of the Society of Actuaries from whom she received the President's Award. Daisy has had a phenomenal career Career and has nurtured many of the actuaries practicing in the Caribbean and in particular in Jamaica. So Daisy, we are very happy to have you here today and we just would like to talk to you about your journey through the actuarial profession. You've accomplished so much during your, your career and I'd like to know what you believe are some of the main reasons why you've been so successful as an actuary. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Carlo. Um, this is very flattering, um, but um, I understand your motives, okay? <laughs> and um, I, I am really impressed that we have actually got to this situation worldwide where we can actually talk about issues like inclusion, and um, women's role in our communities, because at the end of the role, at the end of the day, it's really in our communities, be it international or our village or city or small island, any place like that. Um, reasons why I was able to do some of the things I accomplished in Jamaica and in the Caribbean in particular, I suppose I should say that I grew up in a family of eight children, of whom seven were boys. And I was a second child. And my parents did not treat me differently. In fact, when my mother died, I had just got a scholarship to go to UWI. And I was 18. And my youngest brother was six years old. And the headmaster suggested to my father, the headmaster of my primary school suggested to my father that he should he would write to the university and ask them to defer my scholarship for a year to allow us to settle down because the natural thing was the daughter in the family should take a look after the family until they settle down right that was accepted and i was child number two so and the only daughter and my father said thank you very much but don't you think that when the Lord took my wife, he remembered that he gave my daughter a scholarship? I think she should go. So I was pushed, if I could put it that way, into equality with men without recognizing it. Okay. Uh, and my father was right because the typical thing would have happened would have been I'd probably not leave home until my youngest brother married because that was the situation then. But to answer the question directly, somehow or the other, the government of Jamaica realized it needed an actual. And so I actually went into the actual profession after my master's at the University of Toronto, not knowing what an actual was. Um, a suggestion was made to me by a visiting civil servant that they had the scholarship and they had nobody who was taking it up, would I consider it? I then went to the University of Toronto, had a small 
actual department, two, two lecturers made an appointment and discussed the profession. I thought I was going to discuss the profession with the gentleman. What I remember him saying to me was, the actual profession is very difficult and it's particularly difficult for girls. So why did I do well? Because there are two sets of people, the ones who thought that as a girl I could do it, and the ones who I didn't listen to, who had questions about that. Um, but the truth of the matter is the community needed actually. And once they got over the surprise of not understanding what an actuary does, often they said when I went to, to be interviewed for jobs, actress. And they'd look at me, I wasn't dressed like somebody who could have been an actress. Um, eventually, we got to a situation where, because I have a habit of laughing and making big things sound small, that the conversation would progress. So Daisy, you, you mentioned um, the, the, the influence that your father had on you. And, and the fact that despite the fact that you were a girl, you know, in, in a family full of boys, there was there was immediate equality, which is a, which is a really fantastic thing. Um, who are some of the other people who have influenced you and influenced the progression of your career over the years? Um, that's very difficult to say. I, I, I suspect if I were honest, as, as simple as this answer might sound, my first teacher who herself had had problems in her education because her father had died and so she had to see secondary school. When I was to go to secondary school, she helped my father by saying, Daisy ought to go to a quiet school, not a girls only school. She's not going to be happy there. And she did two things. My mother and my father were very religious people. I never had a dress like this without sleep up till when I was 11. And she recognized that she had to do something about this because my church dresses in particular were going to look too religious. So she made, she offered wow. my mother to make some of my dresses. And she made sure that everyone she made was sleeveless. The other thing she did was she went with us in the car, 125 miles, a long journey in those days, to school to present me to the headmaster as her head student, whom she expected him to take good care of. That headmaster, as it turned out, was a, a very strong personality, short man, but somebody who treated children like persons. I remember him putting his hand out when I was introduced to him for me to shake his hand. Now, no adult had ever done that to me before. They always pat you on the head or on the cheek, you know. They never shook your hand. And I didn't know what to do. And my father said, shake his hand, shake his hand. And I remember that it was a person who had come into his office with my parents and my teacher, and he saw me. I don't know if that makes sense to you. It, it, it definitely does. I mean, you know, you, you felt included from an early age in terms yeah. of how, how you were treated by people. Yeah. You felt yeah. equal. And that yeah. was a very strong foundation for you to, to move on with. Yes. And then we went on. In, he was a PhD, so he wasn't teaching transformers. But in middle school, he had a class called civics, mm -hmm. which was third form, fourth form, and fifth form. Um, as it turned out, this was in the basement of the church, so he could stand and see all three classes. And I remember him saying to us that our generation had to change Jamaica. Of course, we didn't know what he was talking about. And then he started listing things like who was heading what in how the country was run. And there was the Anakans had a Jamaican priest. Most of the other churches had a missionary from abroad. All along down like that. And he kept saying, your generation is going to have 
to do something about your country. And I think as I grew older, I remembered it. I don't mm -hmm. think he said when he was telling us, you know. And remember, though, this was significant because at that time, the secondary population was about 3% of the school population, the school age. So we really were special, though we didn't know it. Yes, def definitely. So, so for you, Daisy, um, it seems to me as if the, the seeds of, of public service were planted at a very early stage for you. Yes. Um, you, you mentioned you spent time in Canada, you spent time in the United Kingdom. And, and, and bearing in mind that, that perspective or that focus with respect to now seeing how your generation was supposed to change Jamaica, how did you feel when you landed in Jamaica again in the 1970s? And what was your perspective in terms of the, the changes that you wanted to see and the contribution that you wanted to make? It was difficult in, in a certain sense because the, um, I became government actually. I was trained by the government. I became government actually. And then it suddenly became very clear that I was not going to get anything to do, although the government had trained me. And um, when I had my second child, I actually went to the financial secretary and said, you know, I can now take some ten years, so I'm going to hang up a shingle. I'm going to pay back my bond, and I'm going to go out on my own because you have not succeeded in identifying real work for me to do. And so I hung up a shingle. Um, it didn't matter. I had a husband, so I could afford some ten years. But to be fair, I got a job the first month. <laughs> right. So, and I then ended up in a situation where the government acknowledged, began to acknowledge what I was talking about. And so I did get a chance because of my interest and because of the training at the government actors department, I did get a chance to do some of the things towards what I call policy. Yes. Financial sector and in insurance and pensions, that sort of thing. But I didn't do it from inside. Yes, I mean, you, you, you've you been a key part or key proponent in terms of establishing rules, legislation regarding regarding governance within the policy framework within Jamaica. Um, seminal pieces like, such as the Insurance Act, um, the Pensions Act, and you yeah. also served as Deputy Director of the, the National Insurance Fund in Jamaica as well. In, in terms of, of participating and working together with other actuaries in order to get some of this work done, how, how did you go about building that coalition of actuarial talent to help further these particular causes and initiatives? Well, once we start, one of the things I started doing when I came home, obviously, was to, um, to interview students about the actuarial profession. And that's how I ended up knowing most of them because I was the examiner for both the institutes then and the Society of Actuaries. So it meant that I, I, I started people bring the children who were good at mathematics to me. And, um, you know, I know something, you know, I sat them, I, I invigilated the exam, that sort of thing. Then one day in, I don't remember the year, I went to a World Congress in Finland. And when the Congress was over, a group of us went to eat um, the night. Con Congress was actually over. And a group of us went to eat. Lisa, I probably told you this already. And I remember I was eating deer. Because, you know, if you go to Finland, you have to eat deer. <laughs> and we were look, talking about the conference. And somebody said, there was an English guy. There was me, um, Thornton. There was me. There was Denise Radix, a Trinidadian. There was Franz Asindor from Trinidad. And there was Richard from Suriname and his wife, and all of these people are actresses except Richard's wife. And, and somebody said, but you realize that you have more actresses in the Caribbean now than Portugal has. And Portugal has, a, has an association that is, that, has, that is a member of the IAA. So you could form an association. So the next year we formed an association and it made sense 
make it Caribbean because immediately we got numbers. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. and obviously, it it was a suggestion that that met with. I mean, everybody joined. I mean. We took the students in. Everybody joined. Um, there was no problem. You, you understand? So it was me. It was us. <laughs> and, and it's been and it's been in, a, a very successful endeavor, Daisy. I mean, the Caribbean Outshore Association has been thriving and surviving uh, since its yes. inception. Yes. Uh, you were its first president for for a six year term. Yeah. And it, it really has grown from strength to strength with over 250 members right now and, and members in many countries throughout the Caribbean and the wider world. Tremendous, tremendous. I don't so know how you... them anymore. <laughs> <laughs> tremendous, tremendous. So, so Daisy, um, you know, you, you and I go way back. <laughs> I'm a former president of the Caribbean Natural Association and, and we both worked together at, at Eckler Limited. And I did have a short stint working with you in the Jamaica office many, many years ago. Yes, and did that you would stay. <laughs> it, it most definitely was one of the most rewarding professional experiences for me. And it was the first time I'd ever worked for, for a woman. I'd like to find out from you, Daisy, um, in terms of the professional experiences that you've had, um, firstly, what would you consider some of your most rewarding experiences, be it in the realm of within the actual profession or in the realm in terms of the public policy that you've helped guide in Jamaica over the years? I think the first one, I'm going to mention two, okay? The first one relates to the first private sector job that I got. It was a, a pension scheme that was established by law for all the workers on the port, the port of Kingston. And in those days, the owners of the shipping companies, the shippers were all foreign. So the only way to have made, uh, established a pension scheme for all those different categories of workers was really an act of parliament. And that was done by Bustamante, who was our first premier, our first prime minister. He was not our first premier, he was our first prime minister. And they had about eight different groups of, of unionized workers on the port. They were called port workers, they're called gearsmen, they were tally clerks, those kind of names. And they, on their union negotiations, they always had the pension scheme as, as something. So the prime minister then, which was Michael Manley, invited me to a meeting with the union leaders of the port workers and said to them, I'm going to give this lady to you and she's going to solve all the problems. <laughs> but remember, he was a trade union man before he became prime minister. So the port workers owned me because they said the prime minister gave me to them. And I will explain to you that we moved from a five and five scheme straight up to a DB scheme with spouses benefits. Wow. And when I was retiring, they came, the association came to my office, presented with a plaque, took a picture of it, and on it they wrote that I had not finished one of the jobs they wanted me to do this time I was retired. And I have that fact still, I should have shown it to you. Um, because they now were pensioners, most of them, and they wanted the pension fund to do some things for them that pension funds don't do. <laughs> <laughs> so, I guess. so that's the beginning of my career. The end of my career now, when I'm retired and really should be sitting at home with my grandchildren, I got pushed by my, my Jamaican colleagues into chairing a monitoring committee that established the pension scheme for the tourism workers in Jamaica. That's all the tourism workers. Well, mm -hmm. In fact, a similar scene. The employers mm -hmm. are really not here. So this act of parliament, which just began really working this year because of COVID, it should have started two years ago. 
in fact, resembles so much what I, I had inherited because I hadn't established the Port Records Book. But it, res it resembles so much what the Port Workers Plan set out to do, which is to fill a gap that allowed a scheme to be established that enjoys all the benefits which normal pension schemes in Jamaica um, are entitled to, main benefit being the tax, um, the tax relief of the savings of pensions. Right. So, you know, if if I had to say the beginning and the end is very easy to remember, both are very easy to remember. But this would be significant because we have some 350,000 tourism workers. Yes. So this is going to be a big scheme. It won't be my scheme, believe me. It's they have been talking about it for about eight years. I came in about the sixth year. And we we we, not me, we finally got it through Parliament. You see that that is true. That's true. That's truly amazing, Daisy. It it it, it really is. Um, you've had a very diverse and varied career, and and definitely have have done a lot of work in terms of working on many boards in terms of of, of governance and setting out governance frameworks, and in in also helping to ensure that the financial services industry within Jamaica runs well. Um, you've you've been chair of the um, Jamaica Publics. Service Commission, um, Chair of the Judicial Services Commission as well, and of the Prices Commission. Uh, how have you, one, found the time to do all of this? <laughs> and two, how have, you, how have you managed to navigate some of these, these appointments at these very senior levels? Um, did you find, for instance, that you had issues to deal with with respect to gender? Did you find that that was an issue for you? Or, or was your reputation so solid that you, you didn't feel as if that was a hurdle or something that you had to show your capabilities to your fellow commissioners on? I, well, let's, say, let's take the non-public sector. Um, let's take the private sector boards. It was beginning to be fashionable to have at least one woman as a director. Okay, so I don't think I really felt strange in those rooms. Um, I felt strange when they expected me to be to be polite and decent. Um, I remember one meeting saying something like this: "What you have said is." unadulterated rubbish and um, the men looked at me when i went in the bathroom the lady who was taking me said to me mrs cook you really tell the man i'm so i said yes it was unadulterated rubbish and nobody contradicted me so why are you worried you know um perhaps i didn't have time to think about it but i'm bold right now in terms of finding time to do this. To, to, the way to advertise your business in Jamaica was to join, you know, the Rotary or the Kiwanis Club or whatever. The problem was Rotary didn't have a lot of, well, they had a few women. There, there was even a special, there was Kiwanis, female Kiwanis and female, female Kiwanians and male Kiwanians. Um, those sort of things. Um, I was really not that kind of person. But the reason I could really spend my time on my board, board, my board appointment was that I'm a night person. So I did my work at night, <laughs> right? I still do. <laughs> um, so I got a chance to know my community by serving as a director on these very boards. That was the point. Then you have to understand that Somebody would have thought that without knowing me, because if they did, they would know I hate numbers. They would have thought that prices commission would have been a, a thing for me to be on. Or when this statistics, when statistics department became an agency, um, the prime minister asked me to serve on that as a, as a deputy chairman. I don't think he, he knew that I don't like numbers. Um, but, you know, there, there was, there was there was contribution to be made in something, but something like that, because 
what what is the family statistics that is the sort of thing that most things we do as you recognize Lisa. data 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 where's the data where's the data where's the data so um i suppose it's sounding easy now but i don't think i had a lot of time to think about it i think i just went to meetings did my work i made notes on my minutes um so that when i went in i had a contribution i was very very dutiful about making sure i knew what i was one of those people who opened their agenda when i got to the meeting i i i liked reading the stuff before i got there i think that helped um the services commission job was a different kind of job because it really i discovered that our civil servants really respected the commission they really felt that it represented them and remember now as chairman you the whole commission does but as chairman i I'd had to meet with the governor general very often and if he didn't agree with something we did or he wanted an explanation it was my job to um to to, to attend and respond and they were gentlemen they really were gentlemen so i i think i had an easy ride because the job needed to be done and so we didn't spend a lot of time on these other peripheral things because the job needed to be done i think that should be a fair comment looking back well daisy i i would honestly say a fair comment would be that your abilities your your intellectual capabilities were such that there wasn't a, a doubt in anyone's mind that you were able to do the job ahead of you and and by virtue of your level of excellence it really did pave a pathway for the rest of us who have come afterwards and, and made it that much easier for us as, as members of the profession, one, to get credibility within the public eye. Your, your legacy of public service is, is unparalleled within the Caribbean profession. And it has really made it easier for public policy persons and people who are setting the agenda within the public sector realm to take on board that an app tree can indeed make a contribution. It's, it's really, Daisy, been a, a pleasure to chat with you today about your, your contribution to the profession. It has been an inspiration to us as, as members of the wider actuarial community to hear of a life that has been lived so well. And to talk to somebody that, you know, to honestly, if I, if I manage to achieve 25% of what you've done, I will consider myself a success. Oh, yeah. Oh, come on, Lisa. Come Daisy. on, Lisa. Come on, Lisa. That's not true. That's not true. Uh, let, me, let me interject something here, Lisa. What I remembered, though, um, there was a, an actual lady named Monica Alana, who, before I left Kingston, had started a lady actress club. Now, I remember, club is a very British word. Right? Mm -hmm. And so there were actual clubs up and down the country, but there were many. I'm not saying women are not allowed in, but they generally were men. And she started the mm -hmm. actress club. And she, to get numbers, she had the students. In. Okay. Um, I think I learned something from her about participation. The mm -hmm. first IA conference I went to, she saw me at the door and she said, Daisy, you have to come and sit with me. I have to show you how to do a conference. Remember, these are the days when you didn't have the telephone to tell somebody you're here. And the notice board outside the conference was always 20 people. So if you sat strategically, they would know that you're there. Remember, you're in many different hotels. Mm -hmm. It is huge. But Monica Allenard, I introduced me to a number of people. Um, but it's her attitude to the students that I think I remember most because it wasn't condescending, it was, it was genuine. She mm -hmm. felt, and remember when I qualified, I was number 13 of the living actress, the okay. living female actress. There were some who died, but I was number 13. Okay. So mm -hmm. there, there were not that many of us, right? Yeah. Um, but she saw a future for us. I remember when I came home, I used to 
write and congratulate any girl whose picture I saw in the list of students who became fellows. And after a time, it was unnecessary to do that because there were so many, you know? Mm -hmm. So um, some of this, I was probably early, but people like you, your generation, it's common and garden for you to be doing what you do. I mean, I don't think anybody finds it strange that you're an actor anymore. Um, it doesn't, the conversation doesn't stop when you say you're an actor. I mean, that's tremendous, you know, because I my life, I hear that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, <laughs> you have done your share too. Your generation has done your share too. And it's getting better, but we cannot be complacent about it. We just have to make sure we do our share. After all, the women are saying we're half a sky, not all of it. But let's make sure our half is held up properly and firmly. Thank you very much. Daisy, thank you very much. <laughs>